Hey, Alec Miller here, founder of Rose and Rogues, and today we're gonna have a bloody good time. So there's been a lot of talk about visual effects on YouTube lately, and I couldn't be happier. Talk about how we make it look so realistic, how we make it look invisible, how we simulate sand, or how we come up with new techniques for blue screens or green screens or sand screens. And all these things, all these techniques, all these, all this talk about the how is very, very interesting and informative, and I love it. But I wanna talk a little bit about the why. Why do we do VFX? Why choose the effects we choose? Our whys inform our hows. It's like when an actor asks, what's my motivation? What they're really asking is, why am I doing this? Why am I performing in this way? And you should do the same thing for your visual effects. So when you're going to do an effect, before you start trying to make it, ask yourself, why would I do it this way? And why not do it another way? So I am gonna teach you how to make an effect. This is gonna be a blood splatter effect or a blood hit as we might call it. This is gonna be one of the most common effects in film. Uh, you're gonna see this on pretty much every TV show, every movie, every soap opera. There's gonna be some character, they're gonna get hit with something or something's gonna burst out of them. Someone's gonna hit someone with a machete. It doesn't matter. You're just gonna need blood to go everywhere. There's three ways I'm gonna look at making this effect. The first way is gonna be practically doing this in camera. And the next way I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna fake it. I'm gonna fake this effect with 2D images. Probably the most common way you've seen it done and um, kind of the hardest to pull off. And the third way I'm gonna do this is to simulate it, which is kind of half fake, half real. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's start with the real world. I think the number one reason to do any effect in camera or practically is the actor, the performer. You're giving them the best opportunity to do their job. So when you have an actor and there's an actual blood splatter that comes out of their shirt, that gives them something to work with. They know exactly where to put their hands, where to grab. They know if it hits their face or gets in their mouth, they're gonna make a, you know, a reaction. So doing it for real is gonna give your actor the best possible performance. A perfect example of this is Veronica Cartwright in Alien. <laughs> Her scream, her reaction, is her real reaction to that. She wasn't expecting to get hit with blood all over her face. It's gonna completely change the performance. Even the best actors are gonna do better if they have more tools at their disposal. My number two reason to do this practically is cost. Surprisingly, it's actually cheaper to do a lot of effects in camera. Now this depends on the effect and so many other variables, but there's a misconception amongst audiences that you know we do so many things in post to save money. Um, that couldn't be farther from the truth a lot of times. The most expensive films have the most visual effects. Look at you know Pirates of the Caribbean 3 or you know Transformers or Avatar. These are very, very expensive movies. Meanwhile, your Blair Witch, your Paranormal Activity, any of your cheap horror films have a lot of effects that are mostly practical. That's also how independent filmmakers usually get their start. If you think about indie films, they're usually a bunch of little practical effects. Now you might find that it's more expensive than you hope but it might still be cheaper than doing it in post and spending countless man hours trying to get this effect looking right. My third reason for doing this practically is you don't have any other way to do it. Let's say you're doing a rock concert and you need someone to pretend to be hit by something or someone to burst out of something. If you need to do something in a play, you want to do something on a game show or do something that's being recorded, but you need people to react to it live. Those all are going to have to be all done practically. So you just don't really have any other option. So now that you know why you might make an effect practically, let's talk about how. In order to do this in camera, we're gonna build a squib. Now, a squib is simply a weird word for anything that explodes on a character. Usually, you would have it against the actor's chest. Sometimes there's an explosive charge in there, or sometimes you just use compressed air. I'm gonna be using compressed air because it's far safer this way, and I don't have to worry about people blowing their fingers off trying to pack black powder into an explosive device. Now, normally, you'd use a compressed air machine, which are, you know, yay big, and they make a lot of noise. You gotta find a place to hide it, and I didn't wanna deal with all that. So I had this genius idea. I was like, what if you could just use a CO2 canister and have that power the whole thing? It could be like handheld. So I started doing research and I came across these bike pumps. And these bike pumps let you just release a bunch of CO2 all at once. I thought I was a genius. Turns out um, a bunch of other people had the same exact idea and you can find various tutorials online for doing this. However, I think mine will be one of the better produced versions of this, and I'm gonna link everything you need in the description down below.
So the first thing you're gonna need, like I said, is gonna be one of these bike pumps. I have a few criteria for these. Criteria number one is you're gonna want it to be made out of metal. The plastic ones can break, especially if you're putting a lot of pressure through them over and over and over again. And so metal was my number one criteria. My criteria number two is it needed to have either a trigger or a button on it. This one has a little thumb button. This means that you can let a lot of air all at once in one go. A lot of them come with levers or valves, and those aren't going to work very well because you can't quickly unscrew and rescrew them, and you need two hands to operate those. The next thing you're gonna need is obviously the CO2 cartridges. These bike pumps are normally fitted for 16 gram um, CO2 cartridges, and they are a little more expensive. They're often branded, and they're very, very hard to find in your local store. Almost nobody's gonna carry a 16 gram CO2 cartridge. So what I recommend doing is actually buying a bunch of 12s or finding a bike pump that fits 12s, and then getting a couple washers. Get your 12 gram CO2 cartridges, and then get your washers and just put those in the bottom, right? Just to give you a little bit of space. You'll eventually figure out exactly how many you need, but I found about two works. They have the, the cup bottom, which is really nice, right? So this is gonna sit in there in place. When you screw this together, you're gonna wanna do it really, really fast. You're probably gonna lose a couple of these um, CO2 cartridges, which is why I recommend the 12 gram and why I recommend buying them in bulk. But if you squeeze it, if you do it tight enough and fast enough, it should, there you go. Nope. We're gonna try this again. Hopefully this time I don't screw it all up and uh, this doesn't go everywhere. Ready? All right, pretty close. There we are, nice and quick. And that time I didn't lose any. And now if I try to shoot this off, there you are. So now that you have your trigger, you're gonna need the next part, which is a barb adapter. Now a barb adapter very simply is just a, an adapter that goes from your Schrader valve to a barbed head, which allows you to connect a tube. And so what this allows us to do is just screw this um, onto here and get a tube attached very easily. So there you have it. Um, my tube is has a 1 8th of an inch internal diameter and a uh, one fourth of an inch external diameter. So you're gonna be out, that's outside diameter and inside diameter. So if you see ID or OD, that's what that's referring to when you're buying tubing. And you just want it to be the same size as your barb adapter. Next, you're gonna need a hose clamp. These are super easy to find as well. The smaller one that you can find, and you're just gonna fasten that on once you get your hose over your barb adapter. Now that that's on there, all you have to do is get to the other end, and there's a few options here. now. What I would do is either 3D print or buy a, a angled um, adapter here. You don't really just want the blood shooting out the end. It's gonna be a nice clean uh, spout. What you can do is stop this up. You can you can block this and then cut like a little rigid, rigid hole into the side of your tube and have it go out that way. That's hard to get aligned right. It's hard to get up flat against the surface. What this does is just make this really easy to attach to close. There's some um, holes in the corners here, and that allows you to sew it onto clothes, or you can do what I did, which is put some Velcro on, um, and then Velcro that onto whatever you want. So I got mine at Roger George Effects, um, but you can probably 3D print one of these. You can also just get like a, go to your local plumbing store and get a, a right angle adapter, that should work too. Um, play around with roughing up the edges and, and stuff like that to see if you can get the right profile of splat that you want. I'm hoping Roger George will sponsor this video, and if so, I'll have some goodies for you in the description down below as far as getting a discount or finding everything. They're really great people. Um, that's also where I got my next effect that I wanna talk to you guys about, which is the next thing you're gonna need, which is blood. Um, there's a million and one tutorials on how to make your own film blood, but this is specifically air squib blood. It's really nice. It works really well. It looks like blood. It gets everywhere, so I'm not going to take it out right now. But this this is really great stuff, and it's thinned out, so it's not as thick as normal stage blood or like a lot of the goopy stuff you're gonna get tutorials for. This thins it out a little bit, makes it so it moves through the hose very easily. I had no problems using it, and it looks great. The next thing you need is a syringe. Um, Roger George was kind enough to throw this in for free when I bought the adapter and the blood from them. They just threw this in and you're just going to use that to, to put the blood into here. You have a couple options once the blood is inside of your tube. What I recommend doing is before you make this uh, fastened, you can put like a little plug in here, like a little piece of banana or something, and that's going to keep the blood from going back into your device. So you can put a little piece of banana in and it will blow out just fine and that will stop it from going back into your trigger. The other thing you can do is just make sure you keep this higher than this. 
So now that I've built my squib, let's test it out. I absolutely love doing practical effects, especially blood effects. It's great, everyone's laughing, everyone's having a good time. You you know, it's getting everywhere and it's, it's just great. It's a really fun way to spend a day of shooting. Now, why would you not do it this way? Well, there's a few answers. The answer number one is safety. Safety is always a concern on set. Um, it's not at all rare to hear stories, tragic stories of people dying on film sets. We try to do everything we can to keep people safe on set. And one of the ways of doing it is not attaching explosive charges to their body. The best visual in the world isn't worth anyone's life. So that's the number one reason to not do something practically. Now, this effect isn't gonna kill anybody. It's practically impossible. Maybe at the very worst, you'll get something in your eye or in your mouth and it'll be uncomfortable, but hurting yourself with a CO2 can, these do get pretty cold if you're firing them off a lot. You might get your tongue stuck to it if you, if you pull a Christmas story, but chances are you'll be pretty safe for this, you know? So that's one of the reasons why I chose to do it this way. We'll be covering more dangerous effects in the future if this does well enough to warrant that. So hit like and hit subscribe if you wanna see us take on more challenging effects. Leaning into safety is really liability. This is the 90s, we're gonna sue you. If something goes wrong on set and it hurts an actor, well, now that just cost them a whole lot of money. So liability is right up there with safety. So outside of safety, what's the next concern? Well, control. Control is always another aspect. It goes hand in hand with safety, but it's a little more nuanced than that, which is, you know, if you're on set and the blood goes in the wrong direction, if it doesn't look right, if the squib fails, um, if something goes wrong, that's it. You shot it and that's how it is. Getting that control back to be able to make it go the way you want, make it look the way you want, be the color you want. Control is the next reason to not do it practically. The last reason I can think of you wouldn't want to do this practically is timing. So. Essentially, if you have a location for only so much time um, or you have to travel to a second location or you need to reset the set and you don't want to spend a ton of time mopping up blood between each shot, your assistant director might lean into your ear and say, let's just do it in post. A bullet hit in post isn't the end of the world. It's not going to make or break your film as opposed to that other thing, which if you can't get a great performance out of your actor because it's the end of the day and you, you're rushing them, that's gonna be the thing you wanna prioritize. You're having to make these tough choices all the time. And sometimes the effects suffer, but the performance is better. So let's move on to option number two, which is faking it. Probably the most common way you've seen this effect done on YouTube and TV shows and just all over the place. We're gonna find some stock footage that someone else shot of a blood splat and just comp it in. So why would you do it this way? Well. I've already mentioned if you just wanna move on on set and not have to deal with the safety precautions, that's a reason. But the other reason is still cost. It's still cheaper to do it this way than full on simulating it. And in some circumstances, it could be cheaper than doing it for real. Now, the problem is you're gonna need someone with the skills, right? You're gonna need someone with those talents and those aren't easy to come by and those people aren't cheap. But if you already know compositing, if you already know After Effects, this is gonna be a pretty cheap option still. So this is more or less the like quick and dirty and simple way of doing this. You can see why it's used so often. So how are we gonna do this? Well, it's pretty simple. The first thing's first, you're just gonna need your footage. I'm using a free pack from actioneffects.com. You can go get free or paid stuff there. It's very easy to use and I like those guys a lot. The next thing you're gonna need is a plate. This is just an old school word for the footage you're gonna put your effects on. You can also have a clean plate, which is the same thing, just without any actors or performers in the shot. So that way you can have the effect go behind them slash in front of them without having to cut them out manually. So with your plate, hopefully you get a lot of metadata. This is typically just included with it by default now, but if you're on a small set, be sure to document this stuff when shooting your footage. This is gonna be things like your ISO, your f-stop, how far away your actor is from the camera, what type of lens you're using, really any information that might be helpful for matching up your effect with the actual footage. It's really easy to overlook this stuff, but taking a minute on set to just take a picture of your camera settings, of the setup, of how far away things are, can really, really help in post. Okay, so let's actually build this effect. 
I'm using After Effects, but like I said, any sort of compositing software will work. So you're gonna need is your footage, obviously, and then you're gonna need your blood effects. Boom, 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 there they are. Um, and layer them up more or less where you want them to be. Once they're there, you're gonna need to key them out if they're not already keyed. And if they're just on a white background like this, what you can simply do is just go to like a multiply. That's gonna get rid of the white and just leave your blood effects. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to do perhaps is change the tint, change, mess with the opacity. You can mess with motion blur. But for me, I find that like 70% opacity on these looks, looks pretty good for what I'm trying to do here. One of the tricky parts about this is if you want it to stick to your actor to where it's coming out of something like this little chest burst effect here. The particles here that are falling down shouldn't be moving at the same rate as the chest. But again, if you're only doing a few frames, you can sort of get away with a lot here. So I'm not even tracking anything for these effects. I'm literally just can keyframing this for like a few frames. And what that's going to do is just make this sort of feel like it's actually stuck to where it's supposed to be. Once you have sort of your main effect down, what you might want to do is add in a secondary effect or two. So this is nice and all, but if you notice, there's no blood on my shirt after I've shot where my hand is. And you'll notice there's nothing behind me either. So what I wanted to do is to cut out and track the hands. So for cutting out the hands, I'm just simply using a roto brush. All you do is you select roto brush and you just paint around the thing you want to extract. You let that play forward until it looks good and then you lock it in. Once you have your top layer cut out, my hands in this case, you can behind it throw another layer. In this case, I'm using a Film Riot's Blood Pack. They're great guys over there. They do a really good job. And if you want to know how to composite this stuff really, really well, I suggest watching their videos. This is quick and dirty. I've then masked that out with a feathered edge and that's just going to create a little pooling effect. Now I did need this to be tracked to the shirt. And what we're going to do for that is use Mocha. I have a hands track and if I open up Mocha, we should be able to see my Mocha track. All I did is draw a little outline around my hands from where I needed to, to start, and then you just let it track forward. Mocha does a fantastic job usually um, for simple tracks like this, especially if you have something really trackable. There's a lot of contrast between my hands and the shirt. It's a pretty easy track. And then once it's all tracked, you hit this button or hit Control S to save, and then you can close this. What you can then do is apply that tracking data to another layer. So what I did is create a null object called Tracker up here at the top. And you just simply click on your hands track, click apply export with your tracker selected. Um, I'm using transform and not corner pin. Corner pin is going to distort whatever image you have. Transform is going to leave the image the same, but just let you parent whatever you want to that tracker. So here we have our tracker and you can see it follows my hands as I fall. And all I have to do is then parent my film riot blood effect that I mentioned before to the tracker. And now I have this wonderfully tracked shape. Now, by default, it's not really rotated the right way. And so I simply made that a 3D layer and rotated it where I wanted it to be. And what's cool is it still follows that 2D track, even though it's a 3D layer. If I wanted to be super accurate, I could like rotate this as my body rotates, but I don't really care. Like I said, you can get away with a lot when it's only on screen for a second or two, and it's pretty subtle. It's under my hands. It just needs to convey the fact that I have been hit. From there, what you might also want to do is key out your character here. I just did a simple roto for the body. Again, I'm wearing kind of high contrast clothing. I'm wearing a yellow, so the blood shows up really easily. You can also hand roto this if you want, because um, it's only going to be a few frames, but you just want to isolate out like the shoulder or anything that's going to be obscuring the background. From there, I'm throwing one more blood effect behind myself here um, with a bit of transparency so that brick shines through. And then I'm using a color link to match it up. It's using the colors of the scene to inform the color of the blood. And this can be really helpful for compositing. And again, you can get really nerdy with this. If I wanted to, I could match the, the noise, right? I could try to match the film grain, but for this shot, for what I'm doing, we can be pretty lazy about this. That's something you're gonna have to think about. If this is gonna be on screen for a while, if this is a key shot, if you need something to happen in slow-mo and it's gonna be really detailed, this might not be the right way to do it because getting everything to actually look good is gonna be hard. There's gonna be little tells. So you have to think about all that when you're making one of these effects. And in my case, I've made this about as easy as it can possibly be. The background's not moving. Um, I'm wearing high contrast clothing. The lighting is very flat, very even. So I've given myself a lot of advantages here. And even then, I would argue 
This doesn't look as good as the practical effect. That brings us into why you would not do it this way. So if it's so easy and cheap, why not just do it this way all the time? Well, there are a few drawbacks. First and foremost is it's fake. It's the most fake. It's, you know, someone else's stock footage shot somewhere on a different location with different lighting and a different camera. So it's not gonna quite look right. It's gonna take a lot of tweaking to really match things up. In real life, you know, when light goes through blood, there's a refraction that happens. There's reflections. You can't really get too close to this effect. Let's say you even have a 4K clip, you're still only gonna be able to zoom in just a little bit before you start to realize that none of the reflections are accurate and nothing really makes sense. You're also limited by the interactions this can have with your characters and the set. You know, it can splat, it can hit something, but it can't like run up and over and down something. You're stuck with that. And it can be hard to find the exact right clip for your scene. So how do you still fake it, but not have any of the downsides that a 2D composite has? Well, that's where you get into simulation. Simulation has become so popular in Hollywood because it's the best of both worlds. You're sort of doing it for real, meaning you get real physics, you get gravity applied to this thing. It's not just floating in space like a compositing effect. You can have it interact with characters or your set. It can reflect and refract all the lighting of your set, but it's still art directable, it's still controllable, and you're not putting anyone at risk when you do it this way. You're not reliant on stock footage you found lying around. You can art direct it, you can change it. If you don't like the way a smoke is billowing or the way something's dripping, you can just adjust it. So it has real world limitations, but you can bend those. But all these benefits mean it's gonna be also the most expensive and complex. So how are we gonna pull this off? Before you jump into your simulation, just like before, it's helpful to have a lot of information, a lot of data. One of the things you're gonna to wanna to do is while on set, capture as much information as possible. And I don't just mean camera info, shutter speed, and all the stuff you wanted to capture before. That metadata is still good, but you're also gonna wanna grab like 3D scans of the set if you can. You're gonna wanna create an HDRI, which is a 360 degree ball of photos that lets you light your simulation the same way as your set is lit. And there's a lot of options for this. The software I'm using is free for iPad and iPhone. It's called HDR i get it like hdr e y e you can find it um just on the app store um you can see there's my backyard and i just took a whole bunch of photos to get this um hdri uh it's not gonna be the best quality you're gonna notice that there's gonna be some stitching errors right there's gonna be stuff that doesn't line up correctly but the fact is it does a good enough job for just getting the lighting right Use it in a pinch, you get it like three, I think for free, and they do a pretty good job. So I recommend using them if you just need a quick and dirty HDRI. Otherwise, you can use something like a 360 camera or something else to capture your HDRI properly. Now, before we jump into the software, um, I wanna explain something that is, Simulations are all completely bespoke, which means they're custom made for each scene. Unlike the previous method where we just took a generic splatter effect and slapped it onto our plate and called it a day, this is gonna be a lot more involved, which means it's gonna be unique to you. So what I want you to do is follow along the general steps here and decide if this is the right way for your production. That's the whole point of this video is, which way is the best way for me to do this? And if that's the case, then look into specific tutorials for each step, because if I were to cover every step for every possibility in this video, it would be a very, very long video. And my goal here is just to explain, here's why this is a harder way to do it than other ways, but perhaps right for your production. So with that out of the way, let's jump into Cinema 4D. So C4D is a jack of all trades, but maybe a master of none. But so am I, so it fits. So the very first thing you're gonna wanna do in generally any scene is create a camera and a light. The light we're creating is just gonna be a dome light and we're gonna import our HDRI into that. If I turn it on, you can see what I was saying before about some things not lining up. Um, the cool thing about this HDRI, we're bracketing the stops, meaning that we have a lot of range and brightness and darkness. So every time you take a photo, it's actually taking multiple photos, usually three to five, and changing the brightness of each photo so that way you have a lot of data and have a lot of control. I'm gonna also import a background object for our camera, and then I'm gonna attach a calibrate tag to 
said camera. And what this is gonna do is just let you draw a bunch of lines all over your footage and then measure out those lines. So this is where that data comes back. So on set, I measured out how long this is, how long the wall is, how tall the wall is, how far away I was from the camera. And then I can put all that data in here. And what that allows me to do is match up this fake camera to our real camera. So that's pretty simple. All you have to do is hit add line, you draw it where you need it to be drawn, and that just allows you to quickly match up your camera. Now that you have your camera calibrated, that's gonna let you do things like put in walls or other objects so that they're in the right spot. They look like they match the floor or any other position you have in your scene. So this way you can kind of recreate your setup. I'm not gonna be using the walls, but they're a good example of something useful that you can do after you've calibrated your camera. So the next step is to recreate me, right? I need something for the sim to work with. All I had to do for that is pretty simple. I made a cylinder for my stomach, a cube for my chest, and then really stretched it out so it covered everything. I then threw that into a volume builder so that way it would smooth it all out and kind of make it more round and, and lumpy like I am. And then uh, simply throw that into a mesher so that it is again something we can interact with. From there, I can bake that all down into a polygon object that then I can export out to our simulation software. Now that we have all that ready to go, let's export it and bring it into our simulation software. Okay, so now we're in our 3D simulation software. For me, I'm using Liquid Gen. Um, Liquid Gen is great. It uh, is very, very fast, but it's not fully featured at the moment. So depending on your simulation, this might not be the best software for you, but for me, for what we're trying to demonstrate here, which is just what it takes to do this, um, it's a good demonstration. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so what do we need to do? Well, first off, we're gonna get rid of this collider here. We're gonna change this to a cone, which you'll see why in a little bit. And then for our shape, I don't really want it to be this ball that's constantly emitting. I wanna recreate our squib. So we're gonna turn this into a cylinder. We're gonna make it more flat, more kind of puck-like. There we go. And then we're gonna rotate this so it's facing sort of the direction we want it to face. But it's still just kind of dribbling out. We don't want that. So. How do we change that? Well, one thing is we're gonna to wanna to change the direction. Right now, it's heading uh, nowhere. And we want it to kind of go flying out. So we wanna change the speed to like negative something pretty high. That looks pretty good. But now it's just spitting out in a continuous stream. We don't want that either. We want it to be like a burst. So we're just gonna add some keyframes to the emission. So I start with a flow rate of zero. We're gonna go forward like a frame or two. And then we're gonna change the flow rate up to like uh, 150 and then we're gonna forward another couple frames, and then we're gonna drop it back down to zero. And so now we get this little burst. So we have our puck, right, our little uh, squib, and then we have this, and this is gonna be sort of a spread for our squib. So we're gonna grab a cone, and we're just gonna line it up like so. And we're gonna make the radius number two down to like pretty much zero, and radius number one a little bit smaller. So now if we hit play, it's kind of getting there, but it's not really looking the way I want it to. So one of the things we need to go to is our simulation and we have sub steps. And what this is, is how many calculations it makes between your frames. And so what I want this to do is be a little higher. We'll make that like four, there we go. And now we're getting a little bit better calculations. Okay, and it looks like we need to change our speed way, way up. So let's move our speed more. There we go. And now we're getting sort of some fun blood splatters. And that's more or less this effect. We can keep tweaking this. We can make this tighter or wider, depending on how we want it to come out. And we can go to our simulation and we can up like the stickiness a lot. And that's gonna make this more of a viscous sort of blood splat. Once you get a simulation you kind of like, we can export that and this will be the blood splurt coming out of the shirt. But the thing is we don't want it just coming out. We want it also hitting the shirt. And for that, we're gonna do a separate sim. Don't try to do everything in one simulation. When you try to do everything in one simulation, things get wonky. What's better to do is get something exactly the way you want it, one way, and then do a separate sim where you do it another way. So we've duplicated our simulation, but we've changed a couple of things. One is we've turned off our spread, we've reversed the direction of our emitter, and we've added these shapes here to kill any extra fall off that we don't wanna have. So just anything that's gonna go the wrong way, we sort of just want to kill it off. So that's what those are there for. I've also imported our shape as a collider and I've added a force to it, which is just making it attracting 
the particles a little bit. All right, so now if we hit play, there it is. And that's more or less it. Now, what's really cool about this is you can art direct this. So if I want this bigger, I can simply change my splat. This is why you would do it this way is here. I can make this really graphic and crazy as need be. And this is also why in a lot of films, things don't look uh, very realistic because what's more satisfying, right? A very sort of realistic splatter. That's just like, I mean, you saw what my, my sim did, right? It's just something small like this. That's pretty realistic as far as uh, my squib tests go. But what's more fun is something more like this, <laughs> where it's just everywhere. And this is what you get in all sorts of movies where, you know, you get these splats that are just so much more fun, but maybe not the most realistic. But I think it's just, it's a ton of fun uh, once you get into simulation. Cause like I said, you have all the, everything that you have in a real world scenario, just, you know, with the ability to crank it to 11. If, you know, a squib doesn't go off right, sometimes that's it, if that's the only take you had, or if the rest of the take was wonderful uh, and like, a, let's say a continuous shot or something, and then the squib doesn't work, uh, you know, it's like, oh, do I really want to re-record our whole one take just for a squib? No, and it's just a ton of fun and no one's getting hurt. And, you know, there's a sense in your head where you're like, it's not even costing me anything. It's just time, right? It's just another couple hours of work, another day of work, another week of work. And you can see where this gets out of control, right? You can see where budgets start to spiral because, you know, if this was a squib, well, we didn't get it or we got it, that's it. But when it's an effect like this, you can just keep going and going and going. So now that we got our splats the way we want, obviously way, way less, uh, than this, we're gonna do a pretty, pretty simple, pretty small one. Um, what you can do is just export your mesh and bring it back into your 3D program of choice. Okay, so here we are back in Cinema 4D with our camera and everything. And all we have to do now is turn on our sim, just import it, I've already imported it, and apply a nice texture to it. Um, for me, I'm just applying a nice blood texture here. Pretty simple, right? Just a red transparent texture. One of the things you're gonna wanna keep note of is IOR, this is index of refraction, and blood has an ind index of refraction of 1.301. And that just makes accurate reflections and refractions on the inside. I have this be pretty dark. Um, the transmission, which is the light that's going through it, is bright and the light that's getting scattered throughout it is pretty dark. And that's that, the reflection's white. So now that we have all that ready, if I hit play, we should see it. There you go. Now it's pretty small here, but that's fine. I can turn off my camera and we can get a little closer. And now we have our two sims playing nicely together and leaving this nice little trail. Now that we have all this looking the way we want, all we have to do is bring it in to our compositing program. So we made a custom HDRI and captured all sorts of data on set. Um, then we had to calibrate our camera and make sure it matched up in 3D. Then we had to match up our lighting. Then we had to make a custom mesh for my shirt. Um, if I had moved a lot more, we would have had to track that mesh and make sure it matched my body movements. Thankfully, I stay pretty still in this. Then we did two different simulations, all to just end up at the first step of the previous method. So you can see why simulations take so much. I'm gonna quickly run through a montage of more or less what I did to get this right, but it's pretty much all the same steps as if you had just started with someone else's footage, except for the footage is more accurate and it's already lit properly. The only difference between the compositing here and the previous method is a more complex track. I did a mesh track, which adheres to the contours of my shirt and um, the movements I make. It's a more accurate track that deforms whatever it is you're tracking. We don't really have the time to get into it here. However, if you're really, really curious about it, let me know in the comments below and I'll make another video on that. So now that I fast forwarded the compositing, let's see how it all turned out. So that looks great. It's awesome. It's a fun way to do this and it's safe, but you still get a ton of control. Why wouldn't you do it this way every time? I think by now you can probably guess your actors are reacting to nothing. They're reacting to air. They're having to pretend that something's in the room. They're having to look around and hope that, 
they get their eye lines right and the reactions right. The other reason not to do it this way is you need specialized software. You can't just open up Adobe Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve and make this effect. You're gonna need something specialized. You're gonna need a special list to do this, or you're gonna to have to train yourself for a long amount of time. This stuff can balloon out of control very quickly. It's easy to get caught in endless loops of revisions and tweaks. It ends up spiraling a lot of projects and you constantly revise it because well, why not? That death by a thousand cuts is something to be avoided. And it's something that if you have a team that knows what they're doing, it's a beautiful, awesome way to do this effect. If you're on a big production, chances are you don't get a choice and chances are this is where you're gonna to start to see this effect be a negative. So if you have control of your production, go in with this mindset, know exactly what you wanna make before you make it. Know what you wanna make while you're on set. Where do I want this to be? How do I want this to look? How should it feel, right? And then when you're in post, your goal is simply to create that. It isn't to test things and experiment and move things around just because you can. It's to achieve a vision. And this is what I think mostly we've lost in Hollywood is the idea of having a vision going into something and wanting to make that specific vision as opposed to, you know, having a rough idea of what we want to make shooting for coverage, which just means getting a whole bunch of angles and then assembling the film via committee. This is really what's causing a lot of the problems and critiques. I think of visual effects when the effects aren't the problem. The problem is the decision makers constantly tweaking the effects over and over again. So that's three ways to make the same effect with different whys. I hope this helps you stop and take a minute to think before you start going straight to YouTube or Google to try to figure out how to do something to ask yourself, why am I doing this effect? And then find the right how. If you enjoyed watching this video, hit like, hit subscribe. We're going to do more in the future. If you have an effect that you want to see done multiple ways, let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.